morning, everyone. So my ta task in the next 20 minutes is review with you the use of endoscopy to assess mucosal healing and the treating to target uh, algorithm. So we all do colonoscopy on patients with ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, and it's not unusual for us to see a patient with this particular presentation. We implement therapy, and then we follow up with endoscopic studies. And there are a number of different outcomes. You can have this type of picture in a patient with this classic pockmarked appearance of kind of burnt out colitis. We have another group of individuals may, that may develop pseudopolyps, and we'll hear from Fernando about doing surveillance for this group of patients. But our ultimate goal, and it's only intuitive, that if we can get our patient to this level, we think that they'll do much better. And now there's data to support this approach. So we've been talking for the past several years about this concept of deep remission. So what are the components of deep remission? Well, obviously, we want our patients to become clinically asymptomatic. We want resolution of laboratory evidence of inflammation, including the various biomarkers like CRP, calprotectin, and the like. Clearly, we want endoscopic healing. And now, in new clinical trials, we're actually looking at the goal, it's certainly not in the uh, guidelines at this point, for histologic healing as the ultimate deep remission. And then obviously, if there are areas which we can't reach with double balloon or other types of modalities, we want stabilization or reversal of various uh, imaging abnormalities. So the concept of treat to target is not new. Our colleagues in internal medicine have been using this for many years, hypertension, type 2 diabetes, and rheumatoid arthritis. In fact, we took the playbook from rheumatologists in trying to understand the approach of using treat to target. All of these diseases, like inflammatory bowel disease, are progressive disorders. Failure to treat early and effectively can lead to serious complications and disability. And disease management for these various diseases has evolved over time. There have been significant advances in treatment for uh, rheumatoid arthritis and the like. And the insights into the importance of early and optimized therapy we've basically taken from the rheumatologist. And if we focus on this treat-to-target approach and, and trying to achieve tight control, per, potentially we can have better outcomes. So how do we use endoscopy in our clinical practice? Well, we know that up to half of patients who are in clinical remission will still have endoscopic evidence of active disease, and you see this on this slide. We all know about the Crohn's disease um, activity index that was used in the past for clinical trials. Patients with a CDAI of 220 to 450 had active disease, and you can see on this that there's no correlation of the CDAI with the Crohn's disease endoscopic index of severity. Dan Preston, who spoke at this and many other meetings, would present a case of a 25-year-old woman who was having eight to 10 bowel movements a day, severe abdominal pain. You touched her and she was tender. Her CDAI score was 350, and then the kicker was this patient has IBS. And I think that we really do appreciate the fact that we cannot use clinical symptoms alone when making decisions for management of patients with ulcerative colitis, and in particular Crohn's disease. Now, in addition to the individuals that have ongoing symptoms and no correlation with endoscopic findings, there's a high prevalence of clinical symptoms in those individuals who have actually attained mucosal healing, and a change in medical regimen is needed in the group of patients that have ongoing symptoms um, and have a, a healing of the mucosa but ongoing symptoms. So, basically, when we make decisions using, uh, using um, clinical symptoms, we can make uh, errors. So the rationale for assessment of endoscopic disease activity is increasingly being applied in our treatment algorithms. So we know that endoscopic features predict outcomes in patients with ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. Um, this is a classic uh, slide that we've seen perhaps once or twice at this meeting. These are individuals with ulcerative colitis, and they're followed. And at one year after the diagnosis, they look at people who have endoscopic healing. And as you can see in the upper part, those individuals that had no, um, and that had endoscopic healing had a very low rate of progression towards more surgeries or more symptoms. Now, this is looking at Crohn's disease. If we look at, in blue, those individuals with no severe endoscopic lesions compared to, in the darker green color, those individuals that have no severe endoscopic lesions had a better prognosis. Their risk of colectomy over one, three, and eight years was decreased. And similarly, in this particular study, getting complete healing or partial healing were both associated with a better outcome. Now, we have evidence from some of the clinical trials for the anti-TNFs. I'll just show you this one particular trial uh, in that alibumab, the CHARM trial, where individuals were randomized, uh, all 
all patients received open label induction, then at two weeks the responders were randomized to either maintenance therapy or placebo. And if we look over time, you can see that the group of individuals who were randomized to placebo had a higher rate of needing hospitalization. So we have the evidence that treating patients and healing them and getting them better is associated with better outcomes. So endoscopy and IBD, I pointed that out earlier, we want to perform endoscopy or a surrogate test when escalating or abandoning medical therapy to confirm disease activity. Now, we mentioned earlier, we heard from Dr. Osterman the concept of the various ways to classify patients. The IBD phenotype ideally should be classified using validated classification symptoms. The Montreal classification is certainly the easiest one that we have and we should standardize endoscopic uh, disease activity in our reports. So this is the Montreal classifications, either E1, E2, or E3 for ulcerative colitis, and you can see for the Montreal classification for Crohn's disease, we look at age of onset, location, and the behavior of penetrating, stricturing, or, comp or, or non stricturing, non-penetrating. Now, in the best of all worlds, when using endoscopic scoring systems, we want a system that's reliable with both inter-rater and intra-rater intra reliability, retest reliability. It should be valid. It should be responsive. In other words, you use the various uh, modality, and when patients get better, you see a change in the scoring system. And clearly, it should be feasible. So for ulcerative colitis, we have the Mayo, the UCEIS, and the UCCIS. The Mayo score clearly is the one that we all use in clinical practice. This is the UCEIS score. You look at vascular pattern, bleeding, and erosions or ulcers, and you basically make the score at the most severe area on flexible sigmoidoscopy. Let's look at some images for uh, Mayo scores. We know that a Mayo 0 is a completely normal exam. This is Mayo 1. There may be some kind of irregularity of the vascular pattern here. Uh, so that's a Mayo 0, rather. Mayo 1 is mild disease, mild erythema, perhaps some decreased vascularity, some friability as you move the scope through the uh, rectum and sigmoid. This is clearly abnormal, a Mayo 2 score, marked erythema, lack of vascular pattern, friability and erosions, and then finally uh, Mayo 3, or severe disease. So the Mayo endoscopic score is easy to use in clinical practice. It's used in clinical trials. And as of 2017, a Mayo 0 or a Mayo 1 are both considered mucosal healing. If we can run the video, please. This is a Mayo 2 a video. This comes from Robarts, from Dr. Dubenko, who provided these uh, videos. Marked erythema, a lack of vascular pattern, of friability. You see some pseudopolyps there and erosion. So this is a Mayo 2. Well, we have probation in our endoscopy unit, and we can certainly uh, give a score using the, uh, the endoscopic reporting system, and we're encouraging all our fellows and all the faculty to put a male score in when doing endoscopy on patients with ulcerative colitis. Now let's run the video for this. This is a Mayo 3. Uh, these patients have spontaneous bleeding. You can see that there are ulcerations throughout the uh, rectosigmoid in this particular patient. So this would be a Mayo, uh, Mayo 3 score. Now, as mentioned by Asher, scoring systems for Crohn's disease, there are several different scoring systems. Uh, the one that we're using in research, but not necessarily in clinical practice, is the SESCD. What are the components of the SESCD? You look at five parts of the bowel, the ilium, the right colon, the transverse colon, the left and sigmoid, and the rectum, and you grade each of these segments looking at the size of the ulcers, the percentage of ulcerated surface, the affected surface, and the presence or absence of narrowing. And you can see that you basically give a score for all uh, of these five segments. Let's run the video, please. This would be an SCS score where we're looking at the size of the ulcers. They're greater than two centimeters. Ulcerated surface in each segment is more than 30%. And the affected surface, meaning ongoing erythema, is greater than 75%. There's no stricture in this particular patient. So this SESCD score for this segment is nine. We'll run the video here. This is another patient. Size of ulcers are clearly smaller. Ulcerated surface is less. The affected surface is still significant at uh, 50 to 75 percent, and there's no stricture in this patient. So this patient has an SESCD of five. Now we've heard through this meeting this whole concept of treating to target, and these guidelines, the STRIDE guidelines, were published in the American Journal of Gastroenterology in 2015. If we concentrate on the endoscopic scores, 
The endoscopic score for ulcerative colitis, a Mayo endoscopic score of zero is the optimal target, but a Mayo endoscopic subscore of one should be the minimum target in clinical trials. Now, endoscopic assessment should be formed in three to six months after the start of therapy for a patient with ulcerative colitis. Now, for Crohn's disease, it was determined that the CDEIS is one option. That's a score of less than three, endosco uh, indicates endoscopic remission. And there are a number of things that when using Crohn's studies, the change in SESCD or the change in CDEIS are quite important in predicting a response. So using relative rather than absolute changes in the SESCD, such as a decrease from baseline of at least 50%, have been shown in clinical trials to be a marker for better clinical outcomes. So when we see a patient with Crohn's disease in 2017, clearly we want resolution of abdominal pain and normalization of their bowel habits as our clinical target. We then want to treat the intestinal inflammation simultaneously with endoscopic or cross-sectional imaging depending on the location, perhaps capsule. And that's done at a later time because it takes much longer for individuals with Crohn's disease to have a response, those individuals with more deep ulceration and transmural inflammation. If you can't do endoscopy to reach the area, then you can certainly consider cross-sectional imaging. When this was presented in 2015, biomarkers including CRP and fecal calprotectin were not the targets but adjunctive measures. But I do think that with more data becoming available, we're using the CRP in those individuals that can mount a CRP with Crohn's disease as an appropriate biomarker. And you'll see on a subsequent slide, once you achieve your target, you need to periodically reassess to maintain that you're not losing the target that you're at. Another evaluation of using endoscopic um, measures in evaluating patients with Crohn's disease was this group, the, IO, um, the International Organization for the Study of uh, Inflammatory Bowel Disease. As noted in the STRIDE guidelines, they also agreed that endoscopic response to therapy was defined as a greater than 50% decrease in the SESCD, with endoscopic remission defined as an SESCD of 0 to 2. Now, we've seen this. This is a very impressive paper by Dr. Colin Bell, which is really setting the stage for how we should be practicing in 2017. This is the schematic of the hypothetical case where we see patients at the time of diagnosis, they have periodic exacerbations, and over time, their disease progresses, and we then have the patient being seen by our surgical colleagues. And the hypothesis is, is that with tight control and repeated monitoring, we can change that curve. We can base basically uh, have less patients going to surgery or developing complications. And this has actually been tested in the CALM study, which I'll mention at the very end. So a treat-to-target treat strategy for Crohn's disease, we would take patients with active disease, we would treat them, and then basically in the process of treating them, we're going to optimize their medical therapy. We can talk about whether that's by proactive or reactive therapeutic drug monitoring. Six months later, we determine whether we've reached our target no symptoms, no positive surrogate marker, no mucosal ulceration. If we reach that target, you can see we continue the treatment, and then at one to two year intervals, we reassess the patient to make sure that they've not drifted away from the target. Have they developed anti-drug antibodies? Have they developed recurrent disease? If we've not reached the target, then basically we need to optimize once again. If we can't optimize with modality one, we can move on to a second therapy. This is, a, again, that Jean-Fred Colin Bell article that adds a few other parameters. In green are things that are currently available. In blue are potential ways that we can use to manage our patients. Quite similar modality, except for now they're adding more predictive tools that we can use, serologic markers, fecal biomarkers, to help us stratify our patients. And in, in the best of all worlds in the future, now with multiple different agents that we have to treat our patients with Crohn's disease, we'll be able to have uh, biomarkers or ways to identify which patient will re respond to which particular uh, agent. So this is the COM study that Gary Lichtenstein had mentioned the other day. This has actually now been uh, published in Lancet as about a week ago. And what this study was, a study that was done, I believe, between 2011 and 2015 at multiple sites in Europe, and they took individuals with relatively new onset Crohn's disease. Again, just like the SANA trial, the average duration of disease in this study was about two years. It was an open-label study where everyone received prednisone for eight to 12 weeks, and then patients were randomized either to a, a treat-to-target algorithm where they got uh, adalimumab by the standard induction dose, 
if they continue to have symptoms, their adalimumab went from every other week to every week, and if they had ongoing symptoms, they then added azathioprine. And interestingly, along the way, if you escalate and the patient did well, you can then de-escalate. And the, the second group received the kind of standard step-up therapy. Now, the primary endpoint was a Crohn's disease endoscopic index of severity of less than four in the absence of deep ulcers, and you can see that that clearly occurred in a higher percentage of individuals who received this kind of treat-to-target uh, algorithm. So there are a number of unresolved challenges that are outlined in, uh, on this. This comes from a paper from David Rubin that was published in cur current gastroenterology reports. How much healing is really necessary to impact outcomes? Can mucosal healing be achieved in most individuals? What's the benefit of escalation of these various agents? What's the time interval? Is it three months? Is it six months between making a decision as to um, moving on to a th different therapy? How accurate are the existing less invasive measures of mucosal injury? Can we de-escalate for those individuals that have early onset disease where we completely resolve the inflammatory process and all the inflammation is gone, can you de-escalate that subgroup of patients? Will patients who feel well be willing to advance their therapy? Even though we're showing them endoscopic images of ongoing inflammation, how will that be uh, taken by patients? Will insurers pay for these tests? So in summary, uh, in terms of approaching this topic of using endoscopic findings to uh, help us take care of our patients with this treat-to-target algorithm, we do know that endoscopic findings can predict clinical course, multiple studies showing this. We're using endoscopy or a surrogate test when altering medical treatments. Decisions based on symptoms alone really should not be used in 2017. The Mayo score is recommended over the UCEIS. The SES-CD is recommended over the CDEIS, and we have accumulating evidence that a treat-to-target approach can lead to superior outcomes in our patients with IBD. And there are a number of ongoing uh, questions. These unanswered questions are being addressed uh, by ongoing studies. Uh, thank you very much.